Hello there, this is Fiona, host and main GM for What Am I Rolling, a twice monthly RPG one shot podcast. This is a bonus QA episode to tide us over to the next one shot, and it is indeed a very special QA, as this week I had the absolute pleasure of interviewing the Rucho Argento lead designer of the upcoming dark fantasy tabletop RPG, Blood and Doom, to be published by Dice Tale Games. In Blood and Doom, players take on the role of adventurers in a doomed world where the rising influence of cults is slowly corrupting the land and its people. Doomsayers, aka GMs, act as the characters' senses, describing events and presenting clues, whilst players interact both with each other and with the characters inhabiting the world of the game. And, of course, fight monsters. Blood and Doom uses a unique dice system and rule set to resolve conflicts, allowing for a tremendous amount of suspense to be added to the stories fleshed out by the entire group. In addition, each adventurer possesses unique abilities that add to the strengths of the group as a whole. It was an absolute delight to interview Ferruccio about Blood and Doom. I think the main game mechanic is really interesting, and I really like the system overall, especially the Blood and Doom points. Blood and Doom really feels like it's going to be a game to look out for in 2023. Whilst the Kickstarter for Blood and Doom is not officially launching till March, Dice Tale Games is releasing a quick start version in early February. You can stay up to date with the latest news from Dice Tale Games and be notified about the Kickstarter and the quick start via their newsletter. I'll put a link to the Dice Tale Games website and all the relevant Blood and Doom links in this episode's show notes. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for joining us. So could you, as our first question, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Who are you and what do you do? Sure. My name is Fruccio Argento. I'm lead designer and writer of the upcoming tabletop RPG Blood and Doom. It's a dark fantasy game about a doomed world in which players take on malevolent cults and battle horrible monsters in an attempt to save their world from corruption. Wow, I love that. So succinct, that introduction. Very smooth segue. <laughs> so how did you get into RPGs and when did, where did it start for you? When did it start? Well, I I had an attempt at playing Dungeons and Dragons 3.5 when I was very young. Mm -hmm. And I still remember, this is like pre-internet days, right? I still remember that I did not understand anything about it. <laughs> All I knew is that like there's someone who's supposed to lead the game and there's players who are playing characters. But I think I was like maybe 14 years old and mm -hmm. without the help, honestly, of uh, tutorials. And I mean, these days it's a lot easier to learn any tabletop role playing game. And back then we just basically gave up after a few sessions, mm. um, but always been a big fan also of the Baldur's Gate uh, video game, which uh, is kind of like the same you know, flavor. Mm -hmm. and, and then I, I started again with fifth edition, it must be like seven, eight years ago now. And it was because a friend of mine actually sent me a message uh, with the the YouTube clip with Vin Diesel playing with yes. some of the Critical Role cards. You remember this mm -hmm. one? Remember, it was yeah. called D and Diesel or something. And I <laughs> and I remember opening this, not being very aware of tabletop role playing games actually mm -hmm. at that point, and being like, "Wow, if you if you can set it up the way they do here, right, with some candles on the table, a skull, and then narrate the way that Matt Mercer does, and really take players into a story like this." And all of a sudden, from this short clip, I just saw the magic or something. And I was like, okay, we're going to do this. And basically, as with anything that I discover, it's like I'm calling my friends, I'm buying these things, and <laughs> we're off to start and, uh, and try it out. So that's when it started. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, it's an amazing experience to play tabletop role-playing games, in my opinion, because it's it's so back to basics right there's no mm -hmm. at least not in my case uh, no. no phone or ipad or anything involved you're sitting at the table you're having fun you're talking to each other spending quality time with each other and that's really why it kind of stuck and uh, mm -hmm. and of course being a game master just i took to that really quickly mm -hmm. and i just enjoy like building things preparing you know uh, yeah. knowing the secrets and seeing the players trying to discover the secrets yeah yeah absolutely so do you prefer then running the games rather than playing in it like it sounds like so if you're like i love the secrets because i definitely feel that as well but do you yeah. regularly run games then or are you a mixture of both no, I do. It's probably 99% me as a game master and 
sometimes when I'm lucky, I get to play. I've <laughs> never played a campaign. So whenever I have played, it was mm. just a one shot, right? Mm -hmm. And most of the time I'm just like, okay, give me just, just give me some pre-generated character. I'm fine. Yeah. I enjoyed the experience of playing mm. and not necessarily spending a lot of time creating a character. Mm -hmm. I think, I think the joy that comes from that, I, I get out of preparing the games and creating yeah. a ton of NPCs and stories uh, in that way. And you know, as, as well as I do probably, and anyone playing out there, that once you're the GM, you know, it's kind of your job. You keep doing it, right? <laughs> and and, and I, I tried with my player group. There's like, do you guys want to try? And it's like, nah, <laughs> you you keep doing it. You're you know, so you're good doing... at it. Yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but I, I did expand my, like I started playing also online mm. uh, with groups that I found online. And, and that's when I first like tried, you know, playing some games as well as a as a player is there a particular rpg that you love to run or are you like a, you dip in and out because i appreciate obviously you've created your own or in the midst of creating your own just now is it but is there yes. a game that you fall back on just now when you're not play testing blood and doom I mean, I love Call of Cthulhu, which yeah. I can play anytime. I'm really a big fan of this game. I'm, uh, mm -hmm. Actually, I was running a, a Masks of Nyarlathotep, the, the mm, campaign, yeah. which was going on already for about one and a half years, I think. Wow. But we've paused that just for the moment because I'm so busy now working on, on Blood and Doom. Mm -hmm. But I definitely want to pick that back up soon. And other than that, I just... I try to to try new games, right? Mm -hmm. Where there's some people that I know who uh, who often are also looking for like the latest, newest games to try out. So so anything that kind of seems interesting to me, I'm I'm willing to try. I think one of the last games that I played, uh, I can't remember what it was. I think no, Tales of the Loop was a while back already. Mm. I've also got Viking Death Squad. It's a oh, yeah. game by uh, yeah by Runehammer. I'm I'm actually wanting to try that out as well. It's, it seems very heavy metal. So yeah. yeah, I like that. So yeah, it sounds it's, like your particular games. Obviously, horror. I know the like, sort of cosmic horror from Call of Cthulhu as well. But also with Tales from the Loop, you have those elements of sort of futuristic stuff, which feels very yeah. different <clears throat> to Blood and Doom. I would say on the outset of it. So let's chat about yeah. them. Tell us a bit about Blood and Doom. What is it for those people who aren't aware of it, and how does it stand out from other RPGs? would you say? Yes. So what is Blood and Doom? I'd say it's definitely a dark fantasy game. It's a little bit more grounded than most of the high fantasy games that are out there right now. As an example, uh, you can only play as a human and the world is filled with terrible monsters and there's cults performing rituals, uh, you know, scheming and plotting the end of the world. So in that sense, it's uh, it's kind of a mix between, you know, think things like Conan the Barbarian, The Witcher, uh, what else can I mention, even the something like The Dark Crystal. There's a lot of influences from just the things that I like personally mm -hmm. that are just all molded together into the, the general atmosphere and vibe of this game. Mm -hmm. um, what was also very important to me is to create a game that is a little bit easier to pick up for new players mm -hmm. than uh, most of the like D&D-esque games out there. But at the same time, I wanted to try and not make a game that's so simple in a way that it can be quite fun, but that mm -hmm. it kind of, for most people, will not be their go-to game to play a, a long campaign. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of really wanted to meet in the middle there, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite challenging, actually, because it's like you tip over really quickly and like, mm -hmm. okay, this is oversimplified, or maybe this is now too crunchy. And for me, I try my best to find a really good balance in that mm -hmm. sense. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that stands out in Blood and Doom is the grittiness, mm -hmm. the realism of it. You can die fairly easy in the game. And yes. I think the, <laughs> as the name I didn't might see that. suggest. Oh. Yeah, so, so it's it's going to take, I mean, if you're playing smart and if you're playing together as, as a group really well, I think it's not even that hard to conquer any kind of situation or, or challenge. But then again, if you're just walking around doing whatever, that won't work in this game. Mm -hmm. And then there's the world, which is to me, maybe even the most fascinating about the game uh, in the fact that it takes inspiration from non-Western European tradition. So it isn't rooted in the what you mostly see, the Tolkien-esque, Arthurian, Western European lore, but it mm -hmm. takes inspiration from like places all over the world. 
-hmm. not directly, but you can definitely see that. I mean, it, there's uh, vast deserts, there's mysterious jungles. That it, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a high adventure in this sense, in this regard, and just something, something maybe new to explore, maybe something that you don't see uh, so very often in tabletop role playing games. Mm -hmm. It's very true. Yeah, like you said, when we think of fantasy, you instantly think castles, you think lush countryside and whatnot, uh, or yeah. long roads. Whereas here, like it's very descriptive about like, yeah, it's, you have your deserts, you have your jungles, and, and you have that sort of atmosphere. It's definitely, uh, in, certain, in the blog post that I was reading, it did definitely felt so different. And you almost could feel that that sort of wet humidity as you're sort of you know, getting your way from point A to point B, which I liked. What I also liked, uh, I was reading through your sort of uh, the descriptor of Blood and Doom, uh, and it's maybe it's just me as a GM, is that you you make it player facing. So that means the players roll mostly all the dice. The GMs don't have to. And I'm like, thank God. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's, I mean, I, I actually think this gets way, way less credit in other games than it deserves. Because to me, once I played a few games that use this kind of player facing uh, mechanic, I immediately was sold on it because it just makes so much more sense because the, the GM has a lot more brain space and time available and energy to manage the narration and to really sort of direct this combat into something mm -hmm. cinematic and amazing mm -hmm. instead of like uh, needing to roll five times for a few enemies keeping track of the initiative order on which we can talk about later which mm. blood and doom doesn't have an initiative order yeah and, and so that kind of just frees up the gem from all these troubles and i think that yeah. maybe it's because i've been gemming for so long that i've mm. kind of been looking for a way to make that more pleasurable for the gem so that mm. they can also enjoy the game without ending up with a headache at the end of the evening because sometimes <laughs> when, when you play a really intense five hour session and you're yeah. the gm and it's and you've prepared it and you're doing all that you can to make that and that especially comes down to the encounters and the combat so mm. that's why i wanted to change it up that being said the gm still can roll for damage because that's just a lot of fun and it just makes <laughs> It also makes sense when you think about it, because if you ask a player to defend themselves so they can roll to defend themselves, it makes mm -hmm. sense that they do so. But it would be a little bit weird in my eyes that they also would roll to see how much, how damage, much damage they take, because yep. that is actually coming from the GM side much more. And mm -hmm. But that is actually kind of fun, because that way the GM at least gets to roll some dice, which we all like. I like that a lot, because I completely agree with you. When I do combat, I do think as a GM, one of my weakest things is the combat. And because I and it's sometimes there's a lot of pressure, because a lot of systems obviously have a massive section on, this is how you do combat. And then so you want to get it right. But then, as you're saying, you're doing all these amazing descriptions, you've putting all the, you know, all the creatures coming onto the battlefield and you're having these encounters and then you're having to roll. And then of the number, you're then going to have to justify what you just said. And you're like, for me, it takes that extra little, like that sort of hill to get over. So the fact you do yeah. with that, but like you said, I do like that idea that, yeah, I'll control how much damage because that, that that's just a number. That doesn't necessarily matter too much to me, the GM. What matters to me is how I hit or how you know, how I uh, orchestrate the fight, which is much better yeah. done through that narrative flow, which, yeah, no, I 100% I agree with that. And I'm like, oh, thank God. Another game where I don't, it, yeah, you said crunchy, but not necessarily yeah. for the GM, which I'm happy about. <laughs> And definitely also, it's the little things like every monster stat block in the game has included at the bottom a small section where you can immediately keep track of them in a combat. So you, there's a, a way to keep track of the turns, to keep track of how much damage they got. And just printing out a simple stat block like that would be enough for you to just, you know, put it beside you on the table and just run it. Mm -hmm. There's no more extra sheets that you need to make and print out or any, yeah. you know, ways yeah. to keep track Admin, of it. Yeah, I, I, I remember ha having had so many like sheets and different like worksheets made just, you know, to manage a combat that uses an initiative order. And uh, yeah. yeah, it feels almost like an Excel spreadsheet and HR documents. Yeah. <laughs> going yeah, yes, yes, yes. And like just going on to what you're saying about the combat itself and like the initiative order, like you don't yeah. have one. It is just up to no. how it works in the story and like how, you know, what is believable, which I yeah. love actually. And I, I that for me is a, 
I guess maybe some people are like, oh, but I, you know, I need to roll for this because there's that, I don't know, trust element perhaps. And they're like, oh, we must do things in this way because the GM or DM says so. Whereas here, when you have the, the doomsayer, it's like, let's just have a conversation about it. And I just feel that's such a nice more trusting relationship more more collaborative relationship that you want to yeah, tell the true. story and, with. and there's well there's a, there's a few things that i like about that. nice by the way that you uh mentioned the word doomsayer right so the gm is called the doomsayer in yes. blood and doom so there's a few things about it right so there's no role for initiative which can be cool in and out of itself because it's kind of a, a thing but then again once you're playing a game and it goes from like storytelling mode right into the the action without a pause. Uh, that's actually pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And there's some rules to the combat, which is that you can only take one turn each round. So even though the order isn't set and you can take turns in each round, you cannot simply take two turns in a row, right? Yeah. So once you've taken a turn, everyone, the characters, as well as the NPCs or monsters, they will have need to have taken, you know, uh, their turn. And then once everyone had their turn, then a new round begins. And then again, it starts. And what I've noticed a lot in play tests and in my game or other games that work like this is that it really works like instinctively because there's an action reaction going on the whole time. So the only thing that you need is in sort of an initiating action, something happens. And then it's like, I want to do this and I'll you know, jump up and grab it. And, and it's like, and then I'm going to do this. And then I'm gonna, there's never like any doubt because it, it's more engaging. And it's like, because you also feel like any moment can be my opportune moment to step in and make a difference, right? So that's uh, that's a lot of fun. And then there's also, uh, of course, it, this will always happen. Uh, you know, these one percent times that you maybe are in conflict about, like, okay, I want to act, but no, maybe you want to act. And and for this, there's actually a built-in mechanic in the game, which is called the initiative role, but it's used entirely different. It's mm. it's only made when there is like a, a difference of opinion, mm -hmm. and then you can make this role which is based on one of your character's statistics, which then decides who goes first. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a tiebreaker, right? Yeah, it's just so much easier. And I think, yeah, you then get that flow that you're not necessarily like, oh, well, I'm always going to be at this point in initiative, so I'll just wait for someone to do it. I think it, hopefully it encourages players to be a bit more on their feet and like are reacting much quicker to the story. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's not only because of the initiative order. That's also no. because of at any point, one of the opponents can attack a player. Mm. It's not the player's turn, but they still will need to roll to defend themselves, right? right. So that, mm -hmm. that means that at any point in the game, they're looking like, okay, man, anytime now I can, you know, be attacked and, mm -hmm. and needing to roll. Not only that, but there's a lot of cool traits and powers or weapon uh, attributes that actually play into attacks or defense which means that even when it's not your turn, you can maybe use some of that to uh, boost your defense or to mm -hmm. get some uh, some kind of benefit there. I was wondering if you could explain to uh, to things, because there's something that I haven't not come across before. If you could tell us a bit more about what blood points are and what doom points are and what their significance is in the mechanics. Blood points are, are like a, a unified point system that players use either for using their powers or magic. And the cool thing about it is that I try in this game to give like martial classes a little bit more to do mm -hmm. so that there's a little bit less of a gap between playing a martial character or a magic character in the sense that, okay, I can attack and okay, I have like 20 different spells with like super cool things that I can do. So these martial powers are like special feats of strength or, uh, you know, like whirlwind attacks and, and these sort of things gaining back or healing damage in combat. So that's what they both use blood points for. So there's no difference actually mm -hmm. in uh, how magic is cast in this sense and how other classes use their powers and activate their powers. They both use blood points. And the cool thing about it is that once an encounter is over and at other points during the game, the group actually earns back blood points as a group. So this means yes. that they can then divide them among each other and during the playtest, it's been a lot of fun seeing how they're trying to estimate which of the characters might be most useful in the next 10 mm. minutes, and then maybe giving them one or two extra blood points over maybe another character that's maybe 
uh, not going to be using their power so much. Yeah, so, no, I, yeah. I really like that. Yeah, that you are doing a collective, I know D&D term here, but long rest. But like, but then you have to portion out. Like you don't all get back up to full. Like it's almost like you're playing a video game and you're like, okay, well, I've only got a certain amount of resources. Well, I'll heal this person and then this person. So again, I like that as a, a way to talk between your players and that maybe build that sort of, yeah. of a team thing. Yeah, you, de- you definitely don't just get all your blood points back as also do you not heal uh, fully when you rest. So there's bruises and there's wounds Mm -hmm. and wounds are longer lasting. They actually require you to recover for an entire day in order to clear those. Mm -hmm. Uh, While bruises can easily be healed by just resting. So it's always uh, a little bit more harsh and uh, you know it's not like okay oh, let's do a long rest and we're ready to go for uh for combat mm-hmm. and then there's the doom points as mm-hmm. you asked so doom points essentially are i mean it's different than a lock mechanic i guess but it's it's similar also in a way in that you can spend the doom point to re-roll all dice that failed because it's dice pool system mm-hmm. and you need to to roll a certain number of successes in order to succeed a roll. So let's say that three of your dice rolled a success and four didn't, then you can re-roll those four and try to succeed. But then again, there's a, a turning side to this, which is the doom points also let you know how many dice you can roll to make a doom roll. And mm-hmm. the doomsayer can ask you at certain points in the game to make a doom roll. So if you don't spend any doom points, you'll make really good doom rolls, right? Because you have a lot of points, you have a lot Mm -hmm. of dice to roll. When you have less or almost no more left, then your doom rolls will really start to uh, fail more often. And these doom rolls are made, and this is what I like about this. I've noticed during like the, what is it, like maybe eight or nine years that I've been GMing, that sometimes players ask me things about whether something is there in the story or in the fictional world. Mm-hmm. And I really couldn't tell them. You so mm-hmm. I could tell them and make it up, but sometimes I feel like it wouldn't be fair if I decided, you see? So for example, yeah. let's say uh, a character gets locked up in a prison cell and they ask me, is there like a loose brick so I can try and escape? Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know. No, of course not. But then again, who am I to decide, right? Mm. Uh, that's kind of fun. So that's when you ask them to make a doom roll. Mm. And if they succeed, then it turns out in their favor. And then the brick is loose and they find it. If they don't, well, tough luck. You have to find another way to get out of the mm. prison cell. Similarly, let's say the party is facing a, a great opponent, right? Some kind of large tentacled monster that could basically take any one of these characters if he or she wanted to. And then it's it's like, why would I be as the game master the one to decide that it's going to attack you or you? And then mm-hmm. everyone in the party can make a doom roll and the mm-hmm. one who rolls the lowest gets attacked by this monster. And game masters can, of course, play around with this and do all mm-hmm. sorts of fun things with these doom points. But it's kind of a way to oh, see how, how lucky players can get, you know, mm-hmm. to see you know, whether to go left or right. If, if you don't know a thing in the fiction, if it's there or not, or if it turns out in their favor, just ask them for a doom roll and let fate that. decide. Yeah, I love that. So uh, just to, just for clarity then, is the doom points, is that for individual characters or is it a community thing for your for your party? It sounds no, like those it's an individual. Are actually, those are actually individual. Yeah, That's what I yeah, thought. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I wouldn't that. want, I, I, I think it would turn out really badly if one of the players spending all Spend the, all the things. Well, that's why I was like, like oh, yeah. don't, you know, we're going to. Well, that's yeah. why I was thinking no. in that final tentacle thing yeah. that you were saying, I was like, God, that'd be really poor if somebody had spent them all like early and everyone's like, well, we've got one left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're it's all your fault. It's yeah. your fault. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> no, that's cool. No, no. I, I assume so. I really like that as a mechanic because, yeah, I do think, like like you said, that when somebody asks you if something specific is there, because obviously they're asking, this is like their yes ending. This is like, I've put this into the yes. scene. Does it exist? And you're not, you don't want to say no, but you're also you're like, well, we're creating this world together. So I love that as a mechanic yeah. to, yes, let's include yeah. it. I think that's amazing. I've, I've, I've watched, I mean, I'm a big YouTube junkie in the sense that I've watched a lot of Runehammer's videos, mm-hmm. Dungeon Craft, Questing Beast, Seth Skorkowski, big shout out to all of them, by the way. And what I noticed is that uh, Hankerin from Runehammer, he's big on those kind of mechanics and things that, like rolling dice to randomly decide something, mm-hmm. which, which if you apply it like, you shouldn't do it too often, of course, no, or too much. But but at a certain point, it's like, let, let's just let this be randomly decided. And even the, the GM or the doomsayer, I should say, can be surprised by the outcome. And it's fun for everyone to see what happens. So the, the doomsayer is at that point more of a, an arbiter than someone who decides what's going to happen. 
there's a great philosophy behind that. I really like that. And that's actually quite a nice segue into my sort of next question on the, sort of the action role. So what I love instantly, you're like, there's no subsystems, there's no extra rules. It's just one thing, which I'm always like, fantastic. So you don't have to go yeah. over many rules. But what I also quite like is that you this doomsday will say you need to use this ability but then it's up to the player to say what or choose what skill i quite like that as a as a way to combine efforts on that front so could you yes. uh, describe what the action role is yeah so the action role is an attempt to simplify the rolling mechanic in the game as to not be uh you know attacks or checks or saving throws or that sort of thing it's everything is an action role and basically all those roles work in the same way you take a handful of d10 you know, it's a dice pool game, you know, the, the higher your ability score, the more dice you will roll. Um, you'll never roll more than 12, by the way. So I think I, I think oh. it's very important not to go like with ridiculous <laughs> amounts oh. of dice. Yeah, and then you need to roll as much 8s, 9s and 10s as you can, because mm. each represents a success. And a 10 actually represents two successes. successes. It's kind mm -hmm. of like a mini critical. Mm -hmm. So then you want to try and get as many successes as you can. And the difficulty usually varies between 1 and 5. Now... Two is like the basic difficulty, mm -hmm. which you mostly roll. And three is difficult. Four and five is going to be, you know, that's going to be really hard. And it's going to be more for high level play. So in this sense, the action roll works the same. Whether you are attacking someone, whether you are casting magic, because when you cast magic, you, you also roll to do this. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's nice that you noticed this, because I think that the uniqueness of, of Blood and Doom is in in many of these small little details that are present in the game, right? And the fact that the Doomsayer does not ask for a skill to be rolled mm -mm. It might be overseen. But then again, it makes a lot of difference because the Doomsayer asks for an ability and then it's up to the player to mm -hmm. look at their skills and be like, I, I think maybe this can work mm -hmm. here. So, you know, is there any benefit to me using this skill? And then it's kind of a conversation, right? Yes. Between the Doomsayer and the players. Now, there doesn't need to be a long conversation, doesn't mm -hmm. need to be a big discussion. But what I do notice is that most of the times it will be fairly easy, fairly clear cut, you know, whether or not a skill can be used. But it's quite fun. And you'll notice that players start to find very original and unique ways right. to use a certain skill in uh, you know for a situation or an action that you may not expect and i hope that you know uh, doomsayers out there will of course uh, you know say yes let's do it you know that's mm. that's the idea behind it so yeah i think there's a lot of fun and also it kind of breaks the whole obligation of some kind of a combination between an ability and a skill it's like mm -hmm. it could be any ability like yeah. you know any ability can be combined with any skill if the situation at hand like you know justifies it or mm -hmm. you know makes it uh, logical i think also and maybe that the one thing that i it came to me as a as a doomsayer and as a gm in general is that if i was running this it instantly i think it encourages players to look at their character sheets more and then think more about like, well this skill how does it apply to this situation whereas you know they're like can i see anything can i do a perception check rather than asking what can I do? It is yeah. that that conversation where they hopefully will engage in their character sheet, in that skills more, and will maybe what I love about uh, RPGs in general, those RPGs that help players learn to play the game almost without you know telling them the rules. You know, is that sort of like it's an organic conversation, as you said, and I think that's yeah. so important to have. A lot of our games nowadays are very narrative and they're very spoken about. Uh, like you speak through conversations and then you go, yeah, let's do a role for it just to just to see. Yeah. I think a lot of people, I think with, with streaming, that sort of thing, obviously the more narrative stuff is coming to a head. But having, I think this, is, like you said, I think you've done an amazing job to have that sort of in that beauty spot of between a little bit crunchy in terms of dice roll. So, you you know, it is a, a game and you can, you can put it together. But at the same time, have that conversation and learn a game as well. And hopefully I would think yeah. your players would then be like, this is really cool. I want to run this game myself, which is always my goal as a GM. It's like, you enjoyed the game. Now you take the book, you take your dice, uh, go play and we'll run the game for somebody else and, and get them involved in like almost like a cult. I know that's what your game is yeah, about. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, yeah, more people cults, in. Yes. Yeah. yeah, no, but you, you make a good argument. And um, I have a, a clear rule in the book written about how it should always be clear to the player before they make any role like what they're doing, what's at stake and what might happen and even what the difficulty is. So they can make a, a judgment call on whether they want to go through with it or not. So um, you'll notice that there's games out there that do not let you know the difficulty, right? So it's kind mm -hmm. of, I'm rolling. I don't even know what the difficulty is. So there's a, li a little bit less of an excitement to it also, because when I know the difficulty, 
I roll, I immediately see, yeah, I made it or I didn't. Mm -hmm. Well, if only the, the game master knows the difficulty, it'd be, I'll roll. And then you look at the game master and tell them, I rolled this. And then it's for them to say like, oh yeah, you made it or no, you mm -hmm. didn't. So I think it's, it's a lot more fun and, and more games do this, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a lot more fun if you just tell them, you know, this is a strength mm -hmm. roll, difficulty three and now do your thing, right? And then make it happen. Yeah. Um, so you immediately know whether you fail, or whether you succeed, and also you kind of know what's at stake. So, um, yeah. I think that's a really interesting one, actually, because I, I hadn't considered that before. Like, yes, as you rightly said, like a lot of, let's say, uh, Dungeons & Dragons, Pathfinder, to a extent, for a lot of the time, it's very rare that a, a game master will will say the difficulty yeah. out loud for those games. But in something like this and some other RPGs I've been playing recently, you're right. I think it's actually a, a sign of a really strong facilitator, actually, to tell you what the thing is and not hide it away. Because I guess that's the thing is like maybe, oh, I don't want to spoil the game. I don't want to ruin it by telling them what they need to get. But actually, you're right. That idea of like, oh, and everyone can get involved. It's not like, oh, we yeah. don't know. I think that just eliminates, I think it's but actually it, much more it, exciting. It, yeah, and it also creates more tension and it also keeps it more real because I, I mean, I assume, you know, game masters are not like lying uh, around the clock, but, mm. but still, if I know this difficulty in advance, there's no way out of it. I mean, if, if I don't know the difficulty, basically the GM could tell me anything, right? I mean, maybe, mm. the, maybe they're fudging the difficulty, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So I'm rolling something like in D&D, like uh, I'm rolling a 16, Maybe the difficulty was 17, but they tell me, yeah, you succeed, right? I don't know. Mm -hmm. So it keeps it fair and it uh, it makes it uh, lethal. And that's no. what Blood and Doom is <laughs> all about. So with a name like Blood and Doom, it's not going to be all uh, yeah. uh, pretty roses and smelling. Yeah, but, but I, by the way, I wanted to just throw it out there that by Blood and Doom is by no means a gory or yeah. shocking game in this sense. It's just meant to be a game that goes back to something that's gritty, dangerous, sort of socially. Uh, a bit more realistic, you know, in, in case people may mistake it for yeah. something that like really tries its best to disturb you or something. That's no. that's definitely no. And I and I think well. that if once you read into it a little bit more, like certainly, and I, I'm only at this time of recording, I'm only going off the blog posts on your website. That yeah. it, but it comes across very much like of the kind it is and i'm sure yeah it like like you said i definitely feel that sort of ideals of like call of cthulhu stuff as well which is not in its essence it's not gory there are elements of horror in it and you can tweak it to yeah. that and i think that you could do the same for that the last thing i wanted to talk about are uh, in terms of the action role is uh the setback die that you also have yeah. in your role is i did that it's, it happens in other rpg systems but i do like it i like seeing it's this idea that you have another d10 that's a different color and then when you fail yeah. it you look at the setback die and if it i presume it's like a low number it, it yeah, might one, trigger. one two and three one two and three yeah one two and three oh no that's, that's several low numbers i didn't realize yeah that. i don't know no, yeah oh. it's gonna it's gonna happen more often than you think. though it only applies if you already failed your role anyway so yes. right if your role if your role succeeds you you don't really need yes. to uh, consider the setback die and if you do fail but then also roll a one two or three on the setback die that, that's going to mean trouble uh, which yes. can mean anything from uh, your weapon uh, breaking your armor getting dented and of course a whole lot of like narrative consequences you know you're sneaking in the back door of a castle all of a mm -hmm. sudden oh my god now also you not only failed your lockpick, but you also alerted the guards or something like this uh, mm -hmm. so that's that's quite a lot of fun and what's even more fun is that when when you're uh, not as good at something, so if you have a low ability score, you'll of course roll less dice. So let's say you're only rolling two or three, then the chances of failing are even bigger and the mm -hmm. chances of, because you always roll your setback dice. So if you ever, ask, for, yeah. for whatever reason, need to roll only one die, it's going to be your setback die. And that's oh. going to greatly increase the chances of a, of a setback so so i'm uh, guessing yeah. then you will never have a dice pool of zero and then you'd have to roll it's always it's always a minimum of one and that will have to be the setback die yeah is that... it, it is always a minimum of one plus you can also instead of spending a doom point to re-roll you can also spend it at any time to roll a minimum of five action dice Ooh, so cool. if you ever find yourself in such an unlucky place that you have uh, <laughs> so you suffer a challenge so a challenge and an, an Edge is like when you gain an advantage and add some dice to your dice pool. The challenge is when you uh, subtract some. Mm -hmm. So if forever, for whatever reason, you roll only like one or two dice, you can always spend a doom point and 
get a chance at succeeding because that's the the only downside about dice pools is that mm-hmm. if you're you know you, you can at a certain point when you're rolling only one die sometimes mm-hmm. it's impossible, impossible to make a certain difficulty so I, I think there should be always a chance that you can uh, can still yeah. uh, do so i love that that idea like oh you, yeah you almost like um like new kids like to go, oh, I'll spend a doom point, get the extra five. But like you said, like later on, you're like, oh no, I did. Oh yeah, that's gonna bite you. That's gonna <laughs> bite you back. Yeah, yeah. The later on, yeah. So my next question then is like, obviously, you've been designing this for a couple of years, I imagine, like getting it yeah. ready. And obviously, I know coming up to the Kickstarter in the new year. But what would you say? And I appreciate this is a horrible thing to say when you're in the middle of like getting it all ready and stuff like that. But so far, what would you say has been the most challenging part of designing Blood and Doom? I definitely noticed, and I didn't even like think about it beforehand. But the most challenging part is the point where the project got so big and ambitious mm-hmm that I had to spend more time checking and editing and uh, sort of directing other members of the team, at which point I was noticing like, oh my God, I, if, if I keep this up, this is going to greatly reduce the time that I have myself to write, which is was very difficult for me to accept. Uh, you know, a, a, an incredibly large chunk of the game had already been written at, the st- at, at that time, especially the rules, mm-hmm. but the setting hadn't quite been, I mean, there's, there's a concept for the setting, but it hadn't been written yet. So, mm-hmm. but then again, you know, when you want to make a set of two books, each about like 350 pages, including yeah. over 250 uh, full color illustrations, its own uh, soundtrack, etc. At a certain point, you have to choose either to make it like a, a one man's smaller project or mm-hmm. then, you know, go all out. And yeah, so we got like a, a great team of of writers and artists aboard. Many of the writers, any award winners, actually, mm-hmm. who uh, who contributed to uh, some great games. So, um, yeah, it's it's now in like the highest gear at this point yeah. uh, and getting everything ready for the quick start guide, which is going to be released in February. That's so exciting. And yeah. then my, my the flip side to this question, which is also, I think, quite cruel and mean, is that what's been so far the best part about designing Blood and Doom, if there has been something? <laughs> oh, the best part. Or if you can choose some wow. things, I appreciate it. It might be lots, lots of little moments. I think, I mean, we've been doing a lot of conventions lately. We went yeah. to Spiel. We went to some uh, conventions in, in uh, Belgium, Facts, and in the Netherlands here. Spell and Spectacle, it's called. And we're also going to go to Dragon Meet in uh, London oh, in December. I'm, I'm at gonna... Dragon Meet. Yeah, I... Oh, right, so we'll meet. I'm, oh, cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm helping running a podcast zone there with my friend. So I do I help out with all the podcasts there. So oh, I'll cool. See. Okay, yeah. we should... Yeah, well, we, we'll see. That's oh, so nice. Yeah. That's so yeah. exciting. Sorry, okay. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah cool. Going. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> but, so uh, m- maybe I can run some Blood and Doom for you. For I would you love and, uh, that. Uh, 100%, yeah. yeah. So uh, to come back to your question, it's, yes. it's talking to the people now for the first time. People who are not my friends or like people that I play with or any of the writers or artists, just random people coming over to the booth, being interested in the game, Mm -hmm. first getting drawn in by the artwork that that we got. And then like, well, what is this all about? And it's like, well, it's, uh, you know, it's a tabletop role-playing game. So, oh, I know this. I've played this and this and this. Okay, and then you start talking about it and to see some of their faces and being genuinely excited and happy that blood and doom is existing and coming out soon and kickstarting is yeah i mean that's that's been at least if not the best experience it was a, a very different and new experience for me mm-hmm. that i hadn't had before because it, it had always been behind closed doors so to speak and now now it's kind of starting to get out there which is a which is a very nice uh, nice experience oh that's yeah. amazing and yeah i can i can imagine because like from i will say from my very limited experience in the tabletop community like going to conventions stuff after appreciate it, we've been in, indoors for the last couple of years it is actually so lovely to go out into the community and people being excited uh to and actually genuinely interested in the games and having that face-to-face contact and talking about stuff so i can only imagine how how wonderful the last couple of conventions have been so about it and oh, yeah, dragon really i can't great. wait except except for my voice which you can still hear is a bit raspy from <laughs> last week but, but, yeah. but i'm sure you, but that's just because you're <laughs> like, excitedly explaining your game which is always really exciting yeah um, and thanks to jason dural for uh ooh. giving me the tip to eat a lot of uh, cough drops but it didn't help any oh no so if he's listening <laughs> yes <laughs> 
my um, penultimate question then for you is that if someone like yourself, you know, had been running games for a little while, but wanted to design their own games, what would your main bit of advice be if they wanted to start designing their own games? Don't make a book <laughs> as big as Blood and Two. Yeah, apart from that, yeah, really? don't go no, big. No, really, don't do it. No, don't do that. You know, it's it's cost heavy. You know, and uh, doing this with a large team, Blood and Doom started out as as something that I told myself is going to be under 180 uh, 180 pages. Right. And currently, <laughs> we're almost approaching 800 uh, in two books. Right, two books. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, so that's half that per book. But still, I'd say play a lot of games. Right. So try out many different things. Uh, see what you like about them a lot. Uh, see also what you don't like about them, right? What kind of things do you want to, would you want to change? And then come up with something of a high concept for your game, right? What is it going to be about? What's the kind of atmosphere? What's the kind of gameplay experience that you want to, that you want to create? Mm -hmm. And then just try and put as much into that as you can from your own new ideas, maybe some some other cool things that you've twisted around or messed around with. Because most of most of these uh, games are like taking some inspiration from one another. And mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I'm sure there's some like games that came completely out of nowhere and had like like ideas that never existed before. But mostly mm -hmm. you see like this little cross pollination from a thing here or a thing there. So I think just fill your mind with a lot of material and mm -hmm. uh, and rule sets and and worlds and settings. And then start from there and just try and, and keep it uh, as, as small as possible. That, that would be my advice. Yeah. I mean, that is sound advice. And yeah, I do like that. That sort of mantra of play more games. So I do think that's important for, for everyone, not just uh, at yeah. first. But yeah, I think try them out and, and see what you like. And, they'll, and, 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 and if you don't, if you, yeah, and if you don't do your paintings yourself, find mm. someone who's, who's like really willing to invest in your game and mm. is also passionate about it and really can do artwork that's exactly what you imagine to have for the game because that's very important to me as is music by the way so yes. you know i i used to play music from the conan exiles uh, video game mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, during some of blood and doom's play tests and i now actually got uh, Newt Avonstraup, who is the composer of the soundtrack, to make a soundtrack for no Blood way. and Doom. So that, that yeah, yeah, wow! So, oh, I bet yeah. that, that must be orchestral, amazing. An orchestral soundtrack, right? Oh. So it's yeah. Oh, that's so, that, uh, that's that is a proper like wow moment. I can imagine like ah, oh, as yeah. That's really I was so I was so happy that he agreed to do it, and and really it seemed like to really like the idea behind Blood and Doom. So Yeah, I d I'm definitely coming around to the idea of using more soundtracks in my games. Again, it was that sort of thing when I was doing them online, I was like, oh, it's just an extra thing. But actually, now that I'm going yeah. back to in person, uh, having a soundtrack in the background really adds so much oh, to do it. You, so. so you don't play music normally not, at the moment? Not, not I, I think just because it was just an extra thing. Again, because I similar to that uh, combat thing, it was always like, I think it was online as well. I couldn't judge the levels because so, we were playing through mm. um, we were playing through Zoom rather than <clears> Discord. <throat> so uh, it was very hard. I, I know there's bots and stuff to challenge that. So so, but now that yeah. we're, we're doing it in person, I give the control over to another player and I say, "Here's the soundtrack. You know, here's the link." Yeah, to the you'll be the DJ for today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And then my friend, he's got a like a, a proper surround sound system, so we we do get it around that. And I do I do quite like it. I've come around to the idea now. Yeah. I just need to again have that little bit more of a brain space to be like, "All right, do this first, set it all up, and then." go so that's yeah, as long as it, as long as it's not too loud and uh you know uh, uh just kind of sort of disturbing the game i guess exactly. like the, yes i think it's very nice to have at least some kind of a there's some tracks that are very good for building tension like you're yeah. you're, you're in a place that you don't belong right and maybe something bad's gonna happen and then there's like dun, 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 it's like oh combat you know it's like <laughs> so that yeah i mean it, it's like for me it's the same as with my music background i think mm -hmm. it's the same as uh, if I were to watch a, a movie without music, that's not, mm. it, it's not going to cut it, right? Mm -mm. That's, that's not, I mean, that's so weird. Uh, mm. Similarly, when I've played, you know, as a player in someone else's game and there's no music, I really, I get kind of nervous or something. It's like, oh, really? it's so empty. There's silence all of the time, like oh, in cool. between. It's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I do think like, yeah, a, a good soundtrack to any film, uh, you never notice it until like something, like something happens to you, you, you definitely could resonate with that music. So uh, yeah, I can, I definitely yeah. see your point on that. But unfortunately we've come to the end of our interview. And so I, I, 
Thank oh, you so no. much. I know. And I, <laughs> we could have gone on for hours. I, I, I know we could have chatted for hours, but it is late where both of us are. But my final yeah. question to you is that where yes. can we find your work? Uh, where can we uh, get <clears throat> updates about Blood and Doom? And are there any other projects? I appreciate you're working incredibly hard on Blood and Doom. So you yeah. might not have anything else coming for a little while, but if, you, if you've got any other projects you'd like to assign first, I'll give you that space to do now. So where can we find Blood and Doom? Yes. So my three other games that I'm working on, not just kidding so no at, at, the moment, at the moment it's just blood and doom and yeah. i would love it if people uh, visited the website uh, it's at dicetailgames.com or if you want bloodanddoom.com uh, works just the same and then on the on the website you can subscribe to our newsletter this is the best way to, to keep up to date and to support us also, for all those that are subscribed to the newsletter, in February, we'll be, uh, we'll be releasing a quick start PDF, mm -hmm. uh, which is going to be 150 pages. It's going to include wow. like all the rules, half of the classes, two adventures. Basically, you get a lot and yes. it's free to download. You can play the game and just try it. And then hopefully, you know, when you get notified on the 21st of March, about the Kickstarter, you know, I hope that everyone who enjoyed the game and like playing it, you know, considers backing it. Mm -hmm. And also on our website, you can find, of course, all our social media handles and follow us on Instagram and, and Twitter, Facebook, or just find us at Die Steel Games uh, on any platform. So that's uh, that's the best that I can ask for. And mm -hmm. and then again, you know, also really, the, I, I really hope that people will enjoy playing the quick starts. We're right now we're like finalizing it putting like everything together and making sure that it's going to be uh, amazing so no it, it sounds like you you've, you're putting a lot of hard work into it and I, i'm i'm always grateful of a good quick start and it sounds like that's what you've put together so i'll be looking forward to that when i when we Thank get the you. newsletter for that and brilliant and is there any other recommendations anything else you want to plug because i appreciate like you said uh it's all blood and doom right now uh, i don't it's have anything else yeah i know <laughs> is there something <laughs> Yeah, so to maybe uh, get in the mood, you know, what, watch the old Conan movies with Arnold mm -hmm. Schwarzenegger. And also check out the highly underrated uh, Dark Crystal uh, show oh, on Netflix. Because I think it's, sometimes I, I, I talk to fantasy fans and I'm like, have you seen the Dark Crystal on Netflix? Mm -hmm. And they're like, no. And I'm like, oh my God, you see, this is, I don't know. It's just amazing what they did with like the love that they showed for the mm -hmm. original movie in this. Mm -hmm. And the kind of things that they do with these puppets and the kind of sort of story and journey that you get drawn into, yeah. even though these are puppets, you're like, you're really feeling it. And it's dark. It's so, so dark. So dark, yeah. Which no, makes I, it, you know, a good oh, good preparation for, for yeah, Blood and I, I, I second that recommendation. It's such a good series self oh, self contained but i would also recommend yeah. the, the the documentary the behind the scenes stuff how they made it because it's bonkers about how they yeah. use all the like the, the fact you're looking at the sets when they're filming it and actually these sets are like so high up because obviously they've got people moving the puppets yes. along and you're just like oh it's my god amazing just, oh, and and i so am good. so disappointed that they will probably not make a second season and, and, and i think to myself you've made all these puppets and everything yeah. is basically ready to go it's it, like it wouldn't take as much that it would for the first season yeah. to, uh, to make a second one but it you know it, it kind of has a nice ending and it kind of rounds things up in a way so in a way. Know, it's still it's still a very nice uh nice show to watch yeah really. i mean i mean who knows i mean hopefully that yeah dark crystal uh age of resistance can live on through other games other rpgs like blood and doom so that's exactly. how that's, that's what i would hope for that and, and be able to create good stories using rpg systems like your own but honestly thank you so much it's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you about blood and doom you're welcome and uh thanks for having me it it was very nice talking to you too. I'm hoping to do more of these special Q&A bonus episodes in future, including Q&As on the one shots we run here at What Am I Rolling? If you have a question or think of an RPG designer you'd like to see interviewed on this podcast, let us know. Our email address is whatamirollingpodcast at gmail.com. And that's it. Great. See you next time. <laughs>